Brian here from Full Body Legs, but most importantly, Upgrade Mentality, episode nine, with my great friend, David Sebastian. For you that know and don't know, David Sebastian is the owner of uh, All Sweet, a pastry shop who focuses on a specialty, okay, a specialty uh, dessert called Kurdush. It's a Hungarian recipe from Transylvania. David, welcome to Upgrade Mentality. Thank you, my brother. So, uh, for those of you that know, those of you that don't know, me and Dave have been good friends now for at least 10 years, right? Almost 10 years? Almost. Almost 10 years. We used to work at a shoe, uh, shoe shop called Little Burgundy in here at Carf in Laval, at Carrefour Laval, okay? And uh, we became great friends from the start. I've always considered him to be my little brother. And one of the reasons why he's invited today in this podcast is because it's an entrepreneurial podcast, not just for entrepreneurs, but also for business owners and people that love business. And we want to talk about his pastry shop, but also the origins, how it got started and all. All right. So, David, first question. Let's go. Talk to me about yourself. Where are you from and your background? So, uh, like the pastry, I'm Hungarian. I was, uh, I was born in Transylvania. Uh, we immigrated here with my family when I was seven years old. Actually, the day after my seventh birthday, so... Oh, wow, the day pretty, right after? Yeah, right after. It was okay, pretty nice, special. Nice gift. Nice gift, yeah. Um, and, um, yeah, so now uh, we came here with uh, seven, eight uh, Hungarian families, Hungarian-Romanian families uh, uh, from Transylvania. And, uh, and so I grew up, uh, I grew, uh, we stayed two years in Montreal, in, uh, in Côte d'Ange, where all the <laughs> immigration... Uh, Immigrated families come, and uh, then we moved to, to Laval um, two, three years later. And so I grew up in Laval, very uh, middle class, you know, uh, very, very nice neighborhood. Uh, regular school, regular uh, high school, made a lot of friends, and that's pretty much it. Uh, you're, so originally, you're from Hungary. I'm from Romania. Romania, sorry. Yeah. You're from Romania, but you're Hungarian uh, origin. That's right. Because right? In, uh, uh, we're going to get to it, I'm sure, later with the pastry as well. But in, uh, in Romania, there's a big minority of, uh, of Hungarians as well. Uh, you know, borders change uh, with, uh, with different uh, world wars and everything. Uh, so there's a lot of, lot of Hungarians in Romania. Okay. And you, I remember you telling me your parents owned also their own business. What did they do when they first arrived here in Canada? That's right. So wh when we moved here... Continue. Yeah. So when we moved here... Um, we uh, they started working. Uh, well, my mom worked in the in the textile industry in the in the textile industry. My dad uh, started in that too. He was mostly working in commerce uh, uh, before we came here. Uh, but they they started working, you know, at really uh, regular jobs. They also, I, I'm like I heard uh, your parents too. They had uh, uh, two jobs sometimes, uh, you know, to uh, to make uh, ends meet. Uh, they were uh, they were cleaning at uh, at houses on, on the weekends, <coughs> so really um, they they started like that. Then my my dad moved into uh, the the airspace uh, industry, uh, which is very uh, very big here in Montreal. Uh, my mom stayed in the in the in the mud, the uh, yeah, yeah, industry de la mode. Ouais. And then uh, well, one time they had an opportunity to buy a Polish. A uh, little deli uh, in Montreal, in the Côte uh, area, actually where we where we first stayed when we came here in Canada, and uh, so they purchased that that little store. Uh, they brought in the Romanian and Hungarian products, and um, that's pretty much uh, what we did for almost uh, I think it was about four years. Uh, but then my mom sold it. Uh, different health reasons and everything so uh, but it was a very nice time uh, to uh, to bring you know Romanian and Hungarian products and we still kept the Polish products for sure uh, and um, and we had a big clientele of East Europeans uh, that, that were coming to see us uh, on Côte d'Ange. Okay so I uh, think that your parents are entrepreneurial because the most, not all, most immigrants that come to Montreal, okay, they don't, they don't want to become entrepreneurs, right? They want to work the nine to five, you know, they, yeah. they, they, they want to make money, but working for other people. Your parents had that entrepreneurial side. 
what did you what did you remember what did you learn young from seeing that so what what uh, I guess what I want to say is what attracted you to it well firstly I think it's uh, it's I think while while why people who, who immigrated here in, uh, in, in Canada uh, they don't necessarily take the entrepreneurial route is sometimes because they don't really have a choice you know they have to provide their fa to their family and um, but you know my my parents uh, they were courageous enough uh, I think like many people uh, who immigrate as well to to start their own little thing uh, you know see where it goes mm -hmm. uh, for them it d didn't necessarily work out as they wished um, they, they had really good success like like I said they they, they didn't stop because it wasn't working uh, but I think that's that's mostly why people don't we uh, take take time and t t have the courage to to start because it takes already a big courage to come to a, yes. to a new country. Yes, for sure. Uh, you don't necessarily speak the the language, and um, you, you just you know try to make it. So for sure, it's a, it was a couple of years later that we arrived that they that they started uh, their, their little business. Um, but yeah, they what, what really it really inspired me. You know that they. First, they inspired me. I, I realized that for sure later, when I was a little bit old, older, uh, the sacrifices they had to make to come here, and then uh, I saw as well the sacrifices uh, they had to make when they had the the business. Uh, for sure, you know, Christmas was very busy. Uh, didn't spend a lot of time with my with my parents on on Christmas when uh, when we had that store. I think that really affected my my mom, especially at that time. Yeah. Uh, my dad still kept his job, uh, but he was certainly. A lot with my with my mom at the store you know delivery delivering stuff uh, buying their um, products products yeah so um, my I think my mom really really found that hard to uh, at that time uh, that she didn't have spend much time with uh, with me um, when, when I was younger uh, during those years uh, but you know it's uh, if you if you don't try you never know so yeah um, for sure so I was, I was, uh, you know, I was still proud of them that they tried, uh, because, uh, like we said, not not many people are gonna gonna try a, a big challenge like that. Yeah, for sure. I'm asking because uh, it's pretty impressive that your parents came uh, already immigrating to a country is already tough, and it on on yeah. one side, and then opening your own business even tougher, right? So it's impressive to see, and today seeing that you're an entrepreneur. You know, you probably took examples out of that. Absolutely. Um, so, how did you become interested in making uh, kurdush, those big goods? And um, what inspired you to make them? How did you came about them? How did you discover it? Uh, so, well, for sure when I, was, uh, when I was younger in Romania, we always had them uh, on, uh, at Christmas markets or just uh, events in the city because it was really it's a really specialized pastry that people uh, would make on mostly on bigger events uh, when I was younger there weren't really a shop open of uh, Kurtosh um, in my city it was really like I said uh, on bigger events festivities um, events in the city uh, so people would come they bring their all their equipment their recipes and they would make the the pastries uh, so it was really something related to um, to nice parties yeah and um, after after uh, uh, traveling with my with my girlfriend in Hungary and then we did Transylvania for a couple of weeks uh, for sure I, I I made her test the uh, the, the Kürtöş Kalac in uh, in Transylvania and um, so we had we had that uh, during that during that trip and when we came back uh, I remember we were redoing the, the backyard uh, at my parents' house and it was always my mom who would come up with these crazy ideas and she said, oh, I think, uh, I think I'm going to tell your dad to make a, a Kürtöş Kalac uh, oven uh, in the backyard. So, um, because you really need like a special, uh, special uh, oven with, uh, traditionally they're made on charcoal uh, with, with a little motor that turns the pastry as it bakes. And... Um, I was like, yeah, sure, you know, I started <coughs> thinking about it and I was like, you know, mom, if, I think if, if we do that in the backyard, I'm going to, I'm just, just threw that out there. I said, I'm going to start a business of it. And we just laughed about it. Uh, I remember we were in the kitchen and, uh, but soon after I, I started realizing, you know, there was only one person who was making this pastry uh, in Quebec, uh, but he was still making a, like a, 
uh, low supply. Yeah, low supply, uh, smaller scale. And uh, but there was not really a, a shop open like you would see Mr. Puff or Beaver Steel. You know, it was, there was no shop open with this pastry. So I said, and I saw um, a company who uh, in in Toronto who was who were who were making it. Um, they seemed pretty very successful. I, I saw that people enjoyed their products. Um, so you, I said, you know what? Why not try it here in Quebec? Uh, so I started researching about the, the equipment that I need. Uh, from Europe because everything I had to import from uh, from Europe and uh, That's that's how it began. Uh, I, I started importing the machines uh, We found a recipe uh, with my mom from Transylvania Because uh, she helped my mom my grandma who lives with us now. Uh, they helped us uh, help me a lot uh, With the recipe we we almost worked I would say about four, five, four, six months uh, on the recipe to you know oh, perfection. Wow. Just it. the recipe. Yeah, yeah exactly. Because I, I really wanted a traditional recipe. Right. Um, so, and she, since uh, she had a background with pastries, you know, from from the deli, um, she had a really good, you know, luggage to of, of knowledge yeah, to sure. uh, yeah, yeah. to transmit to me. So I was never I was never a baker. I was never uh, you know I I, I like cooking, baking some, from time to time. But I would say, I wouldn't say it was my passion. I would say I was more passionate about businesses, about companies, about, uh, you know, bringing a new product to the, to, to the market. And I always, I always opened, uh, I always wanted to open at least, uh, at least a business. I, I didn't know what yet, uh, but you know, it, it's, uh, this opportunity came to me and uh, I said, why not uh, capitalize on it, you know? For sure, for sure. Uh, tell me, what are the origins of the kurdush, the Hungarian pastries? Yeah, so like I said, in Transylvania, there's a big minority of Hungarians. Right. And, um, and it was really them in the mountains who started making these pastries, again, uh, at, at really important events like uh, weddings, um, Christmas markets, mm -hmm. markets in general. Uh, in Eastern Europe, they're very popular. And it traveled a lot uh, all around Eastern Europe mostly, but now it's starting to get to, to the Western part of Europe as well. Uh, but it's very popular in, uh, in Prague as well. They're called uh, Tridelnik over there. Um, or in Romanian, the Romanian name is Kozonak Sekuiesk. Uh, but I would say, I would <laughs> a say. A lot longer, yeah. a lot more difficult to remember. I, I would say, I would say um, even 95% of my Romanian clients, they know it about the uh, Kurtos Kalac name or just Kurtos um, here, in, here in Montreal. So that's really how it started uh, already like three, 400 years ago. Wow, three, 400 years ago. What's crazy about the Kurtos is that um, no offense to Eastern Europeans, but when we think about sweets, right, we always talk about Western Europeans, right? Yeah. So like the Greeks, the Italians, the, the Portuguese, you know, we have a lot of desserts, you know, we have a whole culture about making desserts, right? Uh, however, in Eastern Europe, it's more like the meats, right? So, absolutely, you know, absolutely. like the sausages, the, yeah. the, everything that's smoked meat, you know, that's like really not known in Eastern Europe, but we didn't, I never knew about the kurdush before you showing it to me and making me taste, which, it's an unbelievable taste. If you guys have never tried it, I highly suggest, okay? All sweet, all right, is, is incredible. The taste is incredible. It's really unique as taste. And also the, the texture also is fantastic. Yes, the texture is pretty, uh, I think it's really in the, in the baking process. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, traditionally they're made over charcoal. So the, and before, before baking the pastry, uh, we roll it into sugar. Right. Uh, we put a layer of sugar on top of the dough and that sugar caramelizes as it bakes, wow. so it gives it a, a crunchy outside mm -hmm. and a fluffy inside because it's like a brioche type of dough. Right. So, uh, and what really people uh, like about this, this dessert is that it's not fried. That's the most uh, important thing. And it's never, never fried. And that's what really differentiates us of uh, other, other, other businesses uh, yeah, here in Montreal. Sure. We have a lot of pastries that I fried, you know, and gives, a really uh, heavier taste, heavier to, the, taste yeah. to the to the product, but ours really people what they they enjoy when they see it because it's pretty big. Ours that we make it's about seven inch tall, but in, yeah. in Eastern Europe they're even bigger. Wow! So like my uh, Romanian and Hungarian uh, clients, they always tell me that it's too small. <laughs> my 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 French French. Uh, and English clients, they, they tell me it's too big. So like, <laughs> nobody's never happy. satisfied. Right? Never right. satisfied. So um, that's right. That's really the, the special, um, special, uh, special 
you know, taste to yeah. it that it's crunchy on the outside and fluffy on the inside. Uh, it's crazy because the texture is really, really unique and also uh, in mind with the texture, it's also like the, the, the flavor, how good it tastes, right? Uh, even if you just grab the original one, it's just amazing. But we're going to get to that more, yeah. uh, more in the future questions. Um, so you ordered... You, you ordered your stock from, from Europe, you got them here, you started baking, you found the recipe with your mom and your grandmother. Now, after all that's done, six months to a year, remember it was like six months to a year, it took you for all that. What was, how did you start doing the pastries and what was your first big event? So, um, you know, we always say that people uh, uh, underestimate and overestimate time. Yeah. So when I first got my machines, I was like, I, I think I got them in June and I was like, okay, in July, I'm going to start, you know, my first festival at Parc Jean Drapeau. And uh, it's funny because like when it arrived, like I said, we only worked on the recipe for four, four to six months. So we never got to that festival. <laughs> so uh, I would say for one year almost, I was, I was, I was testing and uh, um, that's something I, I, I learned with the, with the process as well. I, I'm really so, somebody who's a perfectionist, so I, I always wanted something, you know, the product to be perfect. <coughs> but, you know, uh, really uh, important people around me, they told me, okay, you know, now you, you have to make them, you know, you have yeah. to make, the taste, uh, taste, make taste them with the people. And uh, so my first event, I would say, it was, uh, it was at my florist shop where I, I used to work. I was a delivery guy there and um, uh, my boss, Carole, she, she's like my second mom. This is the flower shop that yeah, you used to work shop, at. Yeah, the flower shop, yeah. And uh, Carole, who, who was my, my boss, like I said, like my second mom, she was always pushing, okay, we're gonna do a little event for, for when she started selling her, uh, her Christmas trees. And uh, so we, we put up a tent there in front and, I remember I was like so terrified with, with that first event. And I'm like, we're not, we're not ready. And, you know, I was, the first events were always with my family. Where yeah. Even, I would say, all the events with my, with my family and my, my friends. So people around me really, you know, called me down. And uh, we learned so much together. And uh, that was, I would say, my first event. My first big event was, was then the, the Parc Jean Drapeau uh, event uh, called Weekend du Monde where a lot of uh, cultures, different cultures uh, from Montreal, you know, uh, get together and uh, uh, it's very, very nice. You can taste food from all over the world. Right. And, um, you know, that was a, a huge success to us because I remember we were uh, right next to the Beaver Steel trailer and you had maybe like four or five people do, mm -hmm. uh, in front of them. And uh, we had a line of about 45 to an hour wait in front of our tent. And so like that really showed me like, the potential of the products right. and people really look for something different, something new. And uh, I think we can really offer, offer them that with our products. So the, the, that, that was a big uh, first festival for us, the Paris Jean Drapeau. Uh, and then after that, we, from, from there, uh, you know, we, we made some, I made some contacts uh, through that first festival that I still have today. Uh, that put me in at different festivals in mm -hmm. Montreal, at uh, the Olympic Stadium, at the F1. Um, we, we, we were having an event there, but that got canceled from right. COVID, but everything. But anyways, you know, it's really go putting yourself out there and um, just doing it, man. That's uh, it's most important. Yeah. It's crazy because you were talking about time, right? And how you underestimated time and you're like, oh, well, next month I'll be ready for my first for big sure, event. Yeah. And then you realize you're like six, eight months. You're like, holy shit. Like I'm so far off from what I thought I was. And it's crazy. We often think when we open a business, or when we start a business, when we start a product and stuff, we're like, okay, like we're in this kind of generation that we should like, you know, we click on something and we get it right away, right? This clickbait yeah. kind of generation. But we realize fast in business that doesn't work out like that. Like That's you can right. have a solid idea and think, okay, it's gonna take me two months, ends up taking you a year, year and a half, two years, you That's know what right. I mean? To, to get your, your product out and stuff and never underestimate the time and always try to overestimate your time like that. You, 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 know, you don't make fake promises, okay? Um, so now you, own, you have your own place. Right? That's right. You're on your own place. Where is it exactly? It's on Rachel in on uh, on the plateau, and um, so it's a 
really close to La Banquise or mm -hmm. Mapoule Mouillé. Uh, we have a lot of clients coming from there right. for their desserts. So it's a, I, I think it's a good spot. We didn't, like, like your brother said uh, in his podcast, uh, location is, uh, is really the key for, especially for a new business. For sure. So uh, that's why I chose that place. I really, I, I was looking mostly on, uh, on Plateau, yeah. Okay, and so tell me, how does it work, David? So I come inside your shop, tell me the process. How does it work? So when you come inside, for sure, what, what was really important to me in the, in the shop is that uh, I put the whole uh, baking process and the making process uh, in the front. So you can even see it from outside in the window. There's a little sticker that says, uh, see how it's made. Because I really make the pastries in front of the people. So, you know, it, it's, it really sparks their curiosity from, from outside. Yeah, yeah, and when they sure. come in, the, you smell, yeah, exactly. You smell the, the caramel sugar for sure um, during the baking. And then you see the whole process of when we put the sugar on top of the dough, we bake it, and then we put the topping of your choice because after the caramelizing of the, the sugar, the sugar becomes sticky and that's how we can stick one of the six toppings that we, we offer right now. You know, like walnuts, hazelnut, cinnamon sugar. And uh, then we, uh, the client receives it uh, fresh, always fresh, freshly baked. Nice. And how many flavors do you have? So now we have six flavors, uh, <clears throat> but we have two, uh, we have two format if you want for, uh, for this pastry. Obviously we have the cylinder shape, which is the original Kürtöch Collage, but we also have a little more uh, modern version of it uh, in a cone shape mm -hmm. so during summertime we fill them with uh, with fresh fruits and ice cream which is uh, yeah, the bomb guys yeah. honestly it's crazy and now just last week uh, i came out with the winter menu which is uh, uh, a hot filling of either apple or cherry uh, with whipped cream on top yes yeah, oh so my uh, god oh my god guys so if you've ever been okay what's really cool about this place is that he changes it up according to the seasons, right? So yeah. winter, you're gonna find uh, the hot apples and uh, cherries, and in and summer, you would find ice cream and different toppings. That's really cool too. So you get the like, you know, depending on when you come during yeah. the year, you get the taste. For sure, we had to adapt. You know, we're in, yeah. we're in Quebec, for example, my, my hmm. competitors in, the, in, the, in Toronto, uh, maybe they changed it, but as far as I know, uh, they, they have the, the ice cream all, all winter long. For sure, winter is not as harsh in, 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 in Toronto, but uh, we had to change it up here yeah. in Quebec, uh, you know, uh, five, six months of winter. So we had to, to put uh, some comfort, you know, in the, into winter. Did edition. you first realize that on your first winter or was it, it, did it take you time to realize that? I would say it was uh, our first winter uh, festival uh, that we did it was a little Christmas market in, uh, well, I say little, but there was uh, 500,000 people who <laughs> attended in like uh, a month. Uh, it was our first, uh, like I said, winter festival Christmas market at uh, Illumi, mm -hmm. uh, right beside the 15, the first edition. And uh, we did that for almost 55 days. And for sure, before that, I had to come up with a new idea. Um, you know, the ice cream and the fruits, uh, people are, were already doing it. I saw in Europe, I saw it in, uh, uh, in Toronto, for example. But uh, really with the hot feeling, I, I don't wanna say we're the first, but <laughs> I, I didn't see any, anybody doing with a hot feeling uh, before, before. Crazy, huh? I think David just identified certain weaknesses and he just, he offered a different, a different product according to what he saw that was missing. And I think that's uh, really important for all entrepreneurs is to, is to focus on what is missing and how can you offer it differently if you want to outcompete your competitors. Absolutely. Um, so we can see that you're very young. How old are you, David? I'm 26. 26. We can see that David is, is very young for an entrepreneur, right? Um, what lessons did you learn starting off so young? Because it's not easy. You started your business when you were, what, 22? I was 20. Uh, I started, you know, looking, researching, I would say 21. 21. Yeah. And it was, I remember even me at that time, I was his friend, right? I was 25, 26, and I was starting off my own business. And I was telling him, man, you know, you should wait a bit. Like, you're really young, you know. Uh, but he was so, like, you know, he was so, like, unfearful. And he was just so committed that he ended up opening it up and now he's having great success. But I know it wasn't easy at first because you're so young. So tell me about uh, what lessons uh, you learned in that process. Well, for sure, uh, you know, it wasn't my first business as per se. Like 
it was my first real business, like real in the sense of, you know, uh, registering it, you know, all the, the, the back end taxes and paperwork and everything. But before that, for sure, I, I, I tried, you know, different, different businesses, you know, you name it, uh, multi level marketing, selling stuff online, things like that, that, you know, didn't work out or even business ideas I had, uh, but I didn't really act on it. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's something, it's, it's, it's something, you know, saying that you're going to do something, but then act differently. But really, uh, Old Sweet was really the, one of my first big projects that I, you know, I said, okay, I'm going to do this and, uh, and um, I'm doing it. So really, I would say the uh, big, first big uh, lesson, I would say perseverance for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it goes in hand in hand with, uh, with discipline. Uh, for sure, you know, at the beginning, especially, uh, Sometimes you have to make sacrifices, you know. Uh, I was I, I worked that whole summer for for my machines, for my equipment um, at the at the flower shop. So, yeah, perseverance. As I think another lesson that's uh, often uh, often disregarded. Uh, yeah, disregarded is uh, is showing respect, uh, showing respect to 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 other people and showing just you know normal everyday respect uh, could get you a long way. Like an example, I was uh, I was opening my first uh, credit line at the bank, and um, and I remember I was so stressed, and that lady I was so like you know polite with her, and and uh, we laughed, we talked a little bit, you know, from of her of her family and everything, and she was so nice. I remember I was I was doing maybe like fifteen thousand that that year at the flower shop, and. You know, I, I remember she wrote in something like 30, I was making 30,000 oh, wow. so, so I could get my, you know, credit line because I, I, I talked to her about my business and my plans and, and she, she really, you know, connected with me and, uh, you know, I think that's, that's pretty important, you know, uh, showing respect right. to people. Um, then what else? What else? Um, discipline, you know. Patience, patience mm -hmm. is uh, uh, like we talked about it. You know, you mm -hmm. you know you know me. I'm 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 pretty impatient uh, yeah. person, yeah. but that's that's something I had to to really uh, work on, especially at the beginning. Uh, like I said, I wanted everything now, and I think it's a big it's it's a big thing with our generation. Like you said, yeah. uh, we have everything at the click of a thumb, so. Um, Patience is something uh, I heard in another podcast actually talking about patience. They, they talked about aggressive patience because something it's something, you know, patience when you you just wait for something to, to happen. But aggressive patience, you have to, you know, go out there putting in the actions and, um, you know, doing it even when you don't feel like doing right. it. So um, that's that's really something uh, I learned early on. Aggressive patience. That's very interesting where it's important to be patient, but it's also important to strike when that's the moment right. arrives. Yeah. Um, so you spoke about discipline, patience, consistency. Those are the three things that um, the lessons that you learned. Uh, and it's not easy lessons, right? Those are all lessons that you learn with time. But even when we were younger and me getting to know David, I always known that he was very disciplined and consistent because the, how did we became good friends in the process of being co colleagues was because I used to train people on the side yep. and I remember making him a, a workout program and him following it so much to the T that to this day is one of the best results I've ever had and he's up in my wall into my gym. I have like a, a wall of fame, I call it, and we're like people's best results. I put him on the wall and it's crazy how some people still today tell me, wow, like this is crazy transformation. How did this kid get so big? And you know, and it was like just consistency, effort, and yeah. discipline. That's all it took. Like it didn't, I just told him, follow this to a T and you'll get results. And that's exactly what he did. And he had results. And I think it's crazy because like the reason why I'm in the business that I am is because I see a, a connection with somebody discovering, somebody putting in the hours physically into their bodies and then realizing, awesome. oh man, if I put in the same work, on my body that I do in my business or my life relationships or just everything in life, then I'll have success. And that's exactly what happened to you. I think Absolutely. you had a realization that moment that like, holy shit, like yeah. when I set my mind to something, I can you define the, the work, odds. Yeah, exactly. Cause I think a lot of people, especially younger people, cause David's not a, he's not a large guy now. He's, he's getting larger because he's become more and more of a man. But at the time you were really thin, right? Absolutely. And you were a smaller bone kid. 
And I remember, I remember like people telling me, oh, do you think he could get bigger? Do you think he could get bigger? I was like, yeah, definitely. If he puts in the work, yeah. yeah. And he, and he would, you what, you took 20, you took like 15, 25, 25, 25, 25 pounds yeah. in how much time? In about uh, four months. Four months, guys, that's insane. You're free to yeah. take 25 pounds in four months of, 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 of just weight, okay? Body mass, weight, okay? But the fat in there also. Yeah, for sure. Is, uh, is very, very, very impressive. Um, so, what would you say to anybody who wants to start the business but think they are too young? Because I'm sure there's going to be some people, certain young, younger people are going to listen to our podcast and they have amazing ideas, yet they're like, ah, oh, I don't know. They're scared. They're this, they're that. People telling them otherwise, maybe their parents telling them, no, you shouldn't. What would you give them as advice? Like, how would you prep them? You know, how would yeah. you? Well, for sure, you know, I was in my situation, I was really lucky with, uh, with my parents because they always, you know, always supported me in everything I did. Um, so, but I, I would say, you know, just start doing it. Uh, you know, it's as, as cringy as it's, mm -hmm. as it sounds, you know, age is just a number, right. but you know, I think that's the big advantage, uh, as a young age, at a young age is that, uh, if you, if you mess up, you know, you, you still have time. You, yeah, you, you, for sure. it's, a, it's a learning process. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it's, uh, it's very important to start at a young age, actually, to, to try different things, to see what you, what you like. Uh, like, I didn't know that I'm going to like, you know, baking pastries. And it's not only baking pastries for me. It's also, you know, showing a part of my culture right, uh, for sure. here in Quebec. And, um, you know, I never in a million years thought I would, I would sell, uh, sell pastries or start a, a pastry shop uh, as a business. Mm -hmm. But um, really... Uh, I think at a young age, you have the biggest risk tolerance. Right, for uh, sure. You, you don't, you're not going to lose your house, your, your <laughs> car. You know, you're not going to put your, your family in, uh, in, in danger if, uh, if, you, if, you're, if your business doesn't work out. So I think it's the best moment to, to start for anyone. I like what you said, David, about just start doing it. Like, it's three simple words, but have so yeah. much meaning. It's like you can contemplate all day. You can dream about it. You can fantasize about it. But if you don't start putting in the work yep. physically, then nothing is going to happen, you know? So I think it's very important for people that are younger that want to start a business, people, even people that are older, right? Absolutely, that want to start a yeah. business. Like, just start doing it. And I think people are so scared of failure. And I will tell you something. No matter how much failure you have, know that you only have one life. So, like, just go 100%. Like, yep. if you fail, you fail. It doesn't matter. You're young. You can, you know, even if you're older, it doesn't matter. What's, what's the biggest risk? Money? At the end of the day, you're not going to leave with your money, you know? Absolutely. So, I just, I loved what you said about start doing it. And also your risk tolerance. Like, if you're younger, you have a lot more risk tolerance, right? You can invest a lot more money. And if it doesn't work out, well, you have another 80 years to, to, cat, you know, to get it back, right? Um, perfect. So, what is the best aspect, David, in your opinion, about owning your own business? Because some people maybe listen to this podcast and saying, well, I love business, but I will never own my business. What for you, seeing that you're so young, what is the best aspect, in your opinion, of owning your own business? Well, I think uh, it's really what I, I saw after, before, before starting my business, is uh, I really didn't want to work at a job that it's, uh, it's always the same day to day. Um, so I think that's really the biggest aspect for me is that every day you have new challenges. Mm. Every day you, you continue learning. Uh, that's why it was really important for me to be uh, uh, on the production side mm. in, in my pastry shop for, for at least a year and being there day to day to see, um, to see how the, the routine is going to fold out and um, to see what are the problems, what are the challenges, what are the, the, you, have to, you have to get through. So I would say really um, you, you never have the same day uh, twice, you know? Yeah, for sure. I like what you said about, um, about new challenges and always learning. If you're looking for something that's dynamic and you're always learning, it's definitely owning your own business because either it's, it's just, you know, either it's money management, either it's new line products, Either it's, uh, you know, um, new ways of doing things, uh, people management, all these different aspects, marketing, all these different aspects that maybe at first you're like, I don't know how the hell I'm going to do this. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I'm going to 
But now that you, you, you get into it, well, you learn all these different aspects, that makes it more interesting than maybe working a traditional nine to five. But not all nine to fives, right, is, is, is boring. There are some of them that are more dynamic. Than absolutely, others. absolutely. I, I don't have anything uh, no, against no, sure. a nine to five. And, you know, uh, I think some people uh, need that stability in their life. And, you know, uh, there's, there's that meme on the internet that you start a business so you don't have to work anymore, but then you end up working uh, more. more. So it's... Uh, it's it's that's that's a big challenge with owning a business as well is uh, you you don't really have necessarily that balance uh, in your in your day to day life you know with family with friends but you you learn to you learn to balance everything out uh, at the end balancing is is hard I'm from an entrepreneur yeah, it's sure. very hard even me and him like we're good friends and we see each other what once every second month yeah. one month and it's it's just crazy because time flies by and you can't catch back time you know yeah. I always think about that I'm always like am I working too much am I investing the time in the right things because sure. there's a difference between happiness and success and happy success doesn't translate necessarily to happiness a lot of people are successful they own they're worth millions but they're not necessarily happy and I think if you own millions and you're not happy then you've made a mistake somewhere down Absolutely. the line right um, so we spoke about old sweet now we know that you have your shop what is the next step in your business <sighs> next step next step it could like, be a smaller step you yeah. know it has to be like yeah. you know uh, but uh, what is the next step in the old sweet uh, business I would say um, like I said now I'm on the production uh, every day so now I would say my my biggest challenge uh, moving forward would be uh, you know to to stepping back from the day-to-day -day production uh, operations and really focus on just developing the business because sometimes ev if i'm every day on the production i have less time on the marketing aspects sure. on the social media and everything um so i really have to to focus more on that and I think it's going to be a big challenge because, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm someone who's really a perfectionist. So, uh, you know, giving out the work is sometimes hard for me. So I still I'm still working on that, you know, uh, delegating uh, to other people. And uh, that was a big learning curve with uh, with my current even my current employees. I, I wanted to to do everything, but you can never do everything no. in, a, in a business. So. Um, Really, the next step would be, you know, to to hire somebody to replace me on the production, uh, and maybe, you know, they're gonna they're gonna even maybe, you know, show me improve my recipe, you know, yeah, if, I, sure. if I if I hire a baker or something. So, you never know. Uh, but it's it's again, it's really exciting uh, that new step. Um, and I would like to, like I said, develop the, the business, maybe open restart uh, the festivals mm -hmm. that we really enjoyed. And um, you never know, second, third, uh, all sweet uh, near you. <laughs> Brad, perfect. Well, listen, if you open one in Laval, I'll bring all my clients. Um, perfect. Um, David, next question. Now, if you had a chance to talk to your younger self, okay, what did you learn now in the later years that you would have taught your, your younger self before starting? So, in other words, what would you say to a younger David starting his business that you know now that probably you didn't know beforehand? Well, we talked about uh, patience for mm. sure. Uh, I was certainly lacking patience at the, at the beginning. Um, I would also say, you know, uh, showing confidence uh, because you certainly need it at, a, at an early stage of your business. Um, you know, being young, and uh, starting a business, it's, it can be an advantage, uh, as in people's gonna really support you at the beginning. Uh, they see you that you're young, you know, you're putting it yourself out there, so they're gonna for sure support you. Uh, but at the same time, some people cannot take you really seriously. Like when I was, when I was uh, looking for my, uh, for my actual spot on, on, on Rachel, I did maybe five, six other other spots that you know they were they were all happy to to talk with me and uh, by on email. And when they would see me that I'm so young, and uh, I I look even younger, uh, they were maybe a little afraid to 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 rent their space to me. So uh, for sure, uh, it taught me to to show confidence as well. And I think as a 
when you have employees, when you have you know clients, as in your as in your case, if you don't show confidence, um, especially at the beginning, uh, you know your your leadership can can be questioned, questioned for sure. So um, people gonna listen to you, they're gonna follow you if if uh, and support you if you if you show confidence for sure at the beginning, and um, also I would say. Um, not being afraid to to ask for help. Yeah. You know, I was I was somebody who who uh, I wanted to like I said I wanted to do everything alone, uh, but people around me would offer me their help. And before I started, you know, accepting it, uh, <coughs> I was I was really uh, really just I wanted to do everything myself. And not being afraid to ask questions for sure of people who 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 done and been on your path uh, like your 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 brother can tell you ruben yeah. i went to see him a couple of times about different questions um, about their business um, that i can translate it into mine so really not always being curious about uh, about others uh, what they did mm -hmm. i like what you said about Confidence, patience, but also not be scared to ask for help. And, and I think that's a problem with most businesses is because either we think ourselves to be too high and say we don't need help from anyone, but also it, it, you know, it's, it's not easy to ask for help, especially when you're an entrepreneur, when you, when you have that drive to, you know, you, we have a high compete level, you yep. know what I mean? And if it wasn't for that high compete level, you wouldn't have a business. Yet, you're still asking for help to your competitors, right? Because you still want to learn and you want to integrate what you're learning, what they learn and you integrate in your business. Uh, also, about confidence, confidence in your product, okay? It's very important to have that confidence in. And I know it's not easy, especially when you're, when, when you're launching a new product like yourself, right? Where that nobody has ever tasted. People take yeah. it for granted. Like, oh, what is, what is this? Well, it's crazy that you're launching your own product and you're like, listen, this is really good tasted. And people taste it like, wow, you know, but you have to have that confidence that maybe it's not easy at first, but now that you've gained that experience and confidence also comes with time, right? Absolutely. Like, you know, when you start something, you're never gonna be as confident as five. Like I have clients sometimes that, you know, at the beginning when I started my business, I'm relating to what David is saying. When I started my business, I was very like, if a client didn't show up more than a week at the gym, I would be crying and be like, oh, I'm not doing a good job as a gym owner. And then he would tell me, no, it's, you're doing an amazing job. It's just I'm the one that's being undisciplined. I'm the one that, you know, uh, I have family problems at home or I'm the one that, you know, is overworked and stuff like that. So sometimes, like, even when it comes time to, you know, for a critique, take it positively Absolutely. and don't think automatically that your product or you as a person is the problem. Maybe yeah. it's the other person, yeah. the problem, right? Because the truth, the truth is that you can, you know, uh, you can't satisfy everybody. No. You have to take that 80% mm -hmm. of the people who, who really enjoy their product, your product and, uh, you know, make sure to satisfy them 100% of the time mm -hmm. uh, because that's really the, the, the clients who are going to come back month after month, years after years, and uh, you know, also talk about your product because right. that's really important, especially as a, new, as a new business, as a new product that you're bringing to the market, is that um, people talk about it, you know, word of mouth is the, the most, most important uh, marketing. For sure. David, uh, oh, before last question, okay? Who is your inspiration role model in life and why? Oof. I would say for sure, uh, for sure, my parents. You know, uh, both of them. I think I I, I, I took some some good uh, some good traits from both yeah. of them. You know, they're both really hardworking. Um, my dad is more like a, a little bit of a realist uh, mm -hmm. in life. My my mom, she's more more like a dreamer. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think both combined uh, in me, it's a, it's a it's a good combination, and uh, they really showed me, especially. Uh, uh, with immigrating here, you know, trying their their own business, uh, that you know you don't have to be afraid and just you know just try different things and it might fail, it might work out, but uh, at the end, uh, the most important is that you tried, you know. Yeah, exactly. And for those of you that know or don't know, David's parents are absolute joys of life. They're the nicest individuals uh, I've ever met. And you, if you if you hang out with David for a while, if you just go to a shop grab uh, his, one of his pastries and you talk to him and get a chance to know him, he's one of the nicest individuals ever and it comes from a solid foundation, which is yeah. your parents. Thank you. Um, now, last question, bonus question. 
If you're a wrestler and you're coming out to the ring, <laughs> what would be your coming out song? Man, that's, that's a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> I would say um, Highway to Hell from ACDC. Ah, that's a good beginning, you know? Ah, or maybe something more like old school, like uh, Ice Cube, you know? Ice I Cube? really enjoy Ice Cube, yeah. Perfect. David, uh, my last comments before finishing this podcast. Um, like I mentioned before, me and David have been good friends now for, for a little while. I've always been impressed by his his maturity, even at a, at a younger age than me. Uh, instantly, I think we, we, we clicked right away because we had similar values. I think we were brought up a lot of the same ways. Absolutely. People that know my parents or know David's parents are probably going to say the same thing. Uh, You know, at first when we were young and talking about our, our futures and what we want as businesses, I don't think lots of people believed in us or at least lots of people did believe in us, but you know, a lot of people did talk, but they don't do. And it's fun to see now his progression as an individual, not only in his business, but also his, his maturity and how it's impacted, you know, everything around him and in, in going from just starting at festivals, not owning his own shop and continuing on. So David, I want to thank you so much, not only for, for, for everything you, you've done, but for the person that you are and continue to inspire old and young. <laughs> and thank you so much for coming to Upgrade Mentality, sir. Thank you, Brian. Uh, honestly, I want to say a word too. Uh, I'm, really, uh, I'm really honored to be here, for, uh, to, be, to be real with you, man. I, uh, like, like Brian said, he was really like a, a big brother uh, figure to me and I always look, looked up to him and he always really inspired me with his, uh, with his good, good vibes, his <laughs> good, uh, good energy. So you guys should really follow everything he does at, at full body and uh, with, uh, with the podcast Upgrade Mentality. Uh, you're, if you're not, man, you're really missing out on something because this, this guy is a really ball of energy and uh, when you're around him, uh, he's going to really push you to your limits and uh, I think uh, we all need a little, uh, a little sometimes. Huh? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that, guys. If uh, you're not following the podcast Upgrade Mental, you can find it on Spotify, iTunes and all major platforms for podcasting. Full Body Athletics, you can follow on Instagram, Full Body underscore Athletics. On Facebook, Full Body Athletics. On YouTube, Full Body Athletics. Thank you so much, David. Thank you. Episode number nine is a wrap. Enjoy your day, guys. Ciao. Ciao. One.